to this computer. Okay. Um, so welcome back. Thanks for your patience, both in relocating this and bearing with the time. Uh, I had to meet with some federal potential partners who it looks like will be working with us on some issues. And uh, the slot available was the normal slot for this uh, class. But some of that extra time did afford me a chance to develop a little bit of some additional examples. And what I wanted to do this time was to do a deep dive on uh, one of the issues that we started talking about last time, make sure we're all solid about it and explore this concept that of pushouts um, across uh, a couple more CSET types, right? Um, and uh, we have been talking about uh, within this class, um, of course, uh, CSETs, these uh, maps from schema categories uh, into set that are structure preserving. So they preserve identity and preserve uh, composition and uh, the ways in which uh, these characterize as a database, as it were, uh, the information in a given construct. So we can use this as kind of a very versatile categorical data structure to encode information, right? Um, and um, this, of course, the structure preserving mapping from, from a schema category into set is called a functor and it, it um, by virtue of the fact that it preserves composition, it preserves identity, it's, it's well-behaved. Um, and uh, that allows us to get, get great utility out of it, amongst other things, having a set of operations which we present um, a finitely presented category, only requiring a certain number of generators and relations. And then we can um, have implied by the, those generators um, a much broader and, and often infinite set of morphisms. And because the composition of morphisms here when mapped over is guaranteed to be the same as mapping over the generator and composing it over here, we can um, uh, very easily capture um, this uh, the, the the function of these or the the structure of these large um, of these categories, even though they have infinitely many morphisms, we can express them as composition of a small number of translations of a small number of generators. And we've seen this over many many particular uh, classes. But you'll, of course, recognize this kind of very versatile data structure, categorical data structure can encode graphs, for example, right? Um, and uh, it can encode discrete dynamical systems. Um, and so a given you know, graph turns into a, uh, a particular categorical database where the vertices are mapped to a set, the edges are mapped to a set, and there's a mapping from edges, from the set of edges to the set of vertices uh, shown, shown here for the target or here for the source. And, um, and, and that allows us to have these very nice ways of, of um, capturing structure as data, right? We, we capture these mathematical structures as, as data like this. Um, so we can do it for graphs. We can do it for discrete uh, dynamical systems um, uh, where we can encode a, the evolution of a discrete dynamical system as a database. And we've tried within past, um, uh, past sessions to encode other structures as well. We've gone beyond graphs and uh, discrete dynamical systems to, for example, examine primitive causal loop diagrams, right? Um, where we can encode uh, with a schema for them. Um, by mapping that into set, we can encode different particular causal loop diagrams, right? Um, so we might encode a causal loop diagram here, which has two vertices and a, a minus link from this vertex to that one and a plus link from this vertex to that one. I'm saying from this one, because that's the source and 
to this one, which is the target. And this too is a kind of um, uh, model associated with this, um, this schema category. It's a mapping from it into set. And uh, we can see it can be encoded as a little database. Um, but not only did we see that, we also saw some that are that are uh, reminiscent of the sort of schemas we'll see for agent-based models, where we might have you know dogs, person, age groups, and provinces, a set of persons, a set of dogs, a set of age groups of those people, and a set of provinces in which those people live. And we have um, a little data structure that packs together that information. And for a particular population of interest, um, where we might have a certain set of dogs, a certain set of 20 people, set of five dogs, three province, or excuse me, 10 provinces, three age groups. And these are the encodings of those, those morphisms that we saw up there. Um, we get a little categorical encoding as a data structure of that information, right? And, and and this is, it's easy to miss the significance. We're, we're encoding these structures as models. We all know as software engineers, we could write up Python code or write up, you know, C++ code or write up Julia code or, you know, Scala code or whatever um, to, to capture these. But um, we could have a data structure in code, right? That encodes a graph. But doing so mathematically, doing so as data, describing these things as data, lets us um, uh, make manifest, renders manifest the, the mathematical structure here. So we can transform it, we can analyze it, we can present it, graph, you know, graph it out. We've gotten to the essence of the information by encoding it in this sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and this turns out to be really important when we're dealing with simulation models, which are, you know, where we're coming up to really fast. Probably next week we'll be really diving into that side with stock flow models and more with causal loop and system structure and later with ABMs. It, it's, it's a revolutionary idea. We all know when packages like AnyLogic and packages like Vensim or packages like PowerSim or packages like Repass, we can encode these, describe these with code. But doing so makes renders a lot of the the logic, the rules, the the, the structure opaque, or at least makes it very difficult to, to to understand it. And it and it takes us away from our ability to reason about it, to transform it to analyze it in different ways and flexible ways to graph it out, et cetera. By characterizing these things mathematically, by capturing their essence mathematically, we can leverage a whole sphere of logic and, 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 and a whole battery of different, battery of different analysis uh, tools, different semantics. So this is a powerful thing. We're starting small, but but this is the direction we're going. And I, I, I wanted to remind us of that, right? Now, one of the advantages that we've talked about already in the small of these categorical data structures is that we can reason about them not as one-off things, not as each graph in isolation as some data structure wedged into our code um, where it treats each as a solitude in some fragmented way. But we can reason about them as mathematical structures lets us reason about their commonalities, lets us reason about the mappings between them, right? And and we saw what those mappings were, right? Um, so for each of these, whether it's graphs and and or discrete dynamical systems, or whether it's that agent-based schema or or you know, uh, causal loop diagrams, we saw we could we could capture the notion mathematically because it's a mathematical object. We could reason about its mappings and we could recognize that these are not solitudes, that not all graphs are just disjoint and, and, and forever fragmented and forever separated. 
not all dynamical systems are just exist in isolation with no no you know relevance to each other no relation between them it's not the case at all that that's that's true um um graphs can be related to one another one can be seen as like a coarse graining of another or one can be we could embed one in another right um we could have a bigger causal loop diagram and our causal loop diagram is a small piece of it or we could have another causal loop diagram which kind of summarizes ours, ours is in more detail and that's summarized there. And this is this concept of a structure preserving mapping. And what's that special word we use here for a structure preserving mapping? Can anyone say? We, it begins with H. Homomorphism? Homomorphism. It's a homomorphism, right? Um, and because each of these, it, each particular graph or each, you know, is, is is captured by a mapping from this schema category for graphs to sad, right? Um, we can reason about their relationship to one another, right? Eugenia Tang talks convincingly about this, that we don't want to view the world as a set of one-off solitudes. We we want to reason about their relationships to one another. Um, uh, similarly, if we have discrete dynamical systems, we want to reason about each of them as, as the structure and then about their relationship to one another. So any given one here can be encoded as a mapping from the schema category to set, right? Um, but then we can talk about relationships between these mappings, right? This is a functor, of course. It's a structure preserving mapping from a schema category to set, right? And what we're talking about is a map, a structure preserving mapping between schemas. When we say this causal loop diagram is a coarse graining of this one, or this graph contains this other one, or this one is contained in that graph, um, or summarized by that graph. We're talking about relating to functors. We're saying one contains, um, it 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 it, it um, that there's a structure preserving mapping the transformation from one to the other that kind of embeds it or summarizes it, coarse grains it. Are we comfortable with that idea? And that structure preserving mappings between functors is called a what? Natural transformation. And we spend a while here, you know, talking about for these different domains, the graphs, the. Dyna discrete dynamical systems, agent like the agent like schema and and their C sets, um, these 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 instances of that, right, and that are representing certain agent population, um, or or this one involves in causal loops. Um, we talked about what the flavor of that naturality is, but all of them had this basic sense, didn't they? All of them had the sense that. If you have structure preserving, you should be able to do something in the source um, and map over and get the same thing as mapping over and doing it over here, right? And um, we had that sense with composition, right? When we had a functor preserving composition. And we have that sense here, right? We can either do it in the source here and map over, like, like we could have a graph here. It's in this graph. We'll map over well we'll take take the vertex associated with an edge. So we'll be at an edge and then we'll take the vertex associated with an edge and ask where is that embedded in the other graph versus taking our edge, embedding it in the other graph and saying what's the vert source vertex for it. Remember that? So we have these natural transformations and they were different in their particulars, right? Like for graphs, we have it, you know, shown here, right? We we need to preserve this relationship of the relationship of edges to vertices, right? We, we didn't just slap this down and say, well, this goes here, you know, or this one goes here, this one goes here, and this one goes to, you know, this one. I, no, no, no. There had to be coherence to it. There had to be a well-defined, consistent ordering um, uh, for graphs. But the same thing was true for dynamical systems, right? We needed to preserve th the kind of logic of this, right? Um, we need to be able to either 
start in this system here and take next and then map that over and get the same result as starting in this state and mapping over to this guy and then taking next, right? Remember, remember this yeah. with natural transformations. Now, so so that let us that let us relate these different these different math you know structures, right? Um, but but remember, it's encoding them as data that allows us to do this. Encoding them mathematically, and it so happens we can write them down because we're encoding them mathematically. Their essence, we can write them down as data. Are we good with that that idea? If these were captured in some struct in C or some class in C++, um, you know, we'd have to write custom code to relate these things. But here, just, just think about it, right? Like we've gone through in quick succession, right? From graphs to discrete dynamical systems to causal loop diagrams to ancient schemas. And, and we found that all of them has the same basic categorical logic, right? And all of them, you know, can be embedded. If we go up a level of abstraction, we can realize that far from being solitudes, far from being solitudes as graphs that are just existing in some fragmented space unrelated to each other, we can talk about these relationships. And not every graph can be embedded in another one or coarse grained, but there's a structure to this, right? And so we can talk about the category of graphs. Each of these dots is a what? Each of these dots is a, it's an object. It, it's an object. And that object is a, here, it's a graph, right? Um, and we might think of it as, well, when we put, we can encode that information in the graph is, is as a CSET, right? As a, as a, as a map from, from, from this into set, right? So each of these could be a, a CSET, a Capri sheet, right? As, as, as the term. And these mappings between them are what between their graph? Their graph H, H homomorphisms, structure preserving mappings. And there's no arrow if they're between this graph and that graph if there's no homomorphism, right? Um, um, sometimes there isn't there isn't one. One graph may be unrelated, but there are a lot of graphs that are related to one another. And we can start to talk about this. Um and we could talk about the initial object here, and we could talk about the the you know the final object, the terminal object, right? We could talk about co-products and products and pushouts and pullbacks, and we could talk about exponential objects, these objects that in, objects that encode morphisms here, and we could talk about doing logic on this thing. By goodness, um, actually write logical statements about find me graphs that match these characteristics or what have you. You know, where are there ones that map these characteristics or what have you? But this is true for any of these things. It's not like we have a super great, you know, graph whizzy program that does this. No, no, no. Because they're all C sets, they're, they all have this same mathematical, basic mathematical structure to them. We can do that for discrete dynamical systems. We can do it for, and there's a category of those, right? And it has this beautiful mathematical structure, like set does. That's why it's called a topos. Um, um, and we can do it for causal loop diagrams, those primitive causal loop diagrams, right? And there's a topos for them, right? Um, that has all these nice features. And we can do it for this agent-like schema. And there's a topos for them. And we can reason about them. And by, by virtue of representing these things mathematically, we can encode them in data. And as this, if, if a schema involves this or theory evolves, we can, we can, it turns out, engage in data migration to automatically bring many over to our new schema. Um, but we can also leverage all these categorical bits of categorical machinery, you know, logics, et cetera, without having to build everything from scratch for cause loop diagrams only or for, you know, graphs only or something like that. We get it all kind of for, for free, as it were, by virtue of it being a CSET.
Okay. Um, and, and, and I'm trying to emphasize here something I, I feel I've kind of neglected, which is, you know, we all know we could, again, write code for this, but it, that, that would miss all this, this common substructure, this economy of scale we get by encoding these in the same basic mechanisms. We get all these inc incredibly large amounts of power. And we've been exploring that with categorical operations, like finding the terminal object, finding the initial object in these categories from one to the other, to the other, to the other, find it, or product and co-product, right? But today I wanna to talk about one that's that we started on last time, but we, I, I feel it's one that merits um, some additional attention. I don't think we did it justice last time. And, and we see it a lot, okay? And it's one involving push-outs, okay? And I want to I want to make sure people have a, a good sense of this because there's beauty, there's power, there's utility, and there's generality there all at once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of all those things I spoke about just now that we can do in a topos, you know, we create an exponential object, we could take its product and co-product, we could take its initial and final objects or terminal objects, um, we can take a sub-object classifier, whatever. Um, of those things, we, when we talk about push-out, what's its kind of close cousin? Push-out is a kind of a generalization, or it, it's kind of like one of those others, but it relaxes some conditions. Which, which is it? What's its kind of closest cousin? of all those things, uh, for a push-out. Uh, yeah, it's a code limit. And what's another example of a code limit? A initial, indeed, co-product, co-product. It's like um, a co -pro a souped-up co-product. It has more flexibility than a co-product. And it lets us do some pretty whizzy things, mm -hmm. um, pretty neat things. Pretty useful things, right? Um, I gave the analogy. Well, we'll we'll get to that in a second, but but let's just remember our our co products, eh? Um, and and so we've been talking about these uh, these categories, and it's beautiful, and and um, we we often introduce co products and products uh, together because they're they're. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, duels of each other, right? Here's a product. Yeah. So here's a product, right? Um, where this is like the quintessential, quintessential thing that has information on A and B in the sense that everything else uh, can be framed uniquely as going through this. Mm -hmm. um, we can have other ways of encoding A and B that are more, you know, loose and kind of more wasteful and, and less parsimonious, but but all of them have a unique way of, of kind of mapping down to this one since such that, um, you know, their mapping down to A can be factorized into a mapping through this, by the this composed with this, right? Um, any given map down can be factorized uh, into this. Okay, and, and same thing with, with this. Now, a co-product is just like this, but turned around, right? These are called projection maps. So, you know, extract the A component, extract the B. And we talked about that because what they look like is a bit different with SAT. You know, they they have all just A, A cross B is like a pair, and we just take A, or for the other one, we just take B, the B component, the second component of the pair, or the first component, right? But with with something like a co-product of graphs, um, we're projecting down things like morphisms and um, and and edges. Um, with a co-product of the schema for excuse me the, the the product for the schema for causal loop diagrams, we could project out one or project out uh, the other. But here and those, these are homomorphisms. Remember, we, we, we've talked about that. So here's co-product. Instead of projection maps, we have injection maps. 
and these are often written as kind of iota thing here, okay? Um, and um, and they have various flavors, and you know, in set we have either this or this, right? Um, uh, and uh, and if you think about it, sets. The very notion of a set is kind of a if you think about the elements in a set, it's really kind of a co-producty thing, right? Like you either of this or this or this or this, right? You have a bunch of kind of things that aren't particularly connected with one another, and you either have this or this or or another one. And we'll we may come back to that, okay? Um uh okay. Um and, and co-products have different flavors, but I'm I'm gonna talk about here co-products. Um uh, I want to talk about co-products in the context of C sets, right? Um but I want to relate them specifically to these push out things. Okay. Now why blue? Um why aren't I come on? Um so what's going on here? Okay. Um uh so no, 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 it's this one here. Okay. Um so Eugenia Cheng's joy of abstraction is of course always worth looking at for, for most of these topics, but particularly here, right? Um and she does a wonderful job talking about pullbacks and push-ups. Um, and as Nona said, right? As Nona said, um, co-limits, like there's this class of things that are close cousins of one another, initial objects, co-products, push-outs. These are all like examples of co-limits over diagrams, just like at the cost of kind of going back here on uh pullbacks and products and terminal categories are all examples of these sort of taking limits, these cones over diagrams, these sort of finding um, uh, the universal cone over the diagram, the one through which everything else factorizes. That's products. But here we're going to have co-cones. We're going to have these arrows turned around and and going up the other way. Okay. Um, and this this one will be on the way. It's kind of everything factorizes through it. But the point is that all of those, the, the terminal for, for 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 products, excuse me, for limits, the terminal object, the product, and the pullback are all limits over some diagram, right? They're all limits over a diagram. And what that diagram looks like is 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 different. And okay, I don't have a nice picture. I thought I had a beautiful picture of it, but I I don't. Um, doesn't look like I have a beautiful picture. Um, uh, I'm not even sure I have an ugly picture of it. Um, uh, but but each of the these things products. Well, here here's David uh, David uh, Spivak's uh, thing. Right here's here's like. Um, a uh, pullback one. Here's an equalizer. In fact, uh, uh, here's a. Um, uh, I, I this is. Oh, I guess it's called self. Uh, this is product. We have no connections between these. It's kind of like, you know, elements in a set. We just have a bunch of them. Um, uh, whereas here we have these diagrams between them um, of this form, and it turns out there's equalizers. Um, but down here for pushouts, we have um, this uh, diagram in, in in reverse. So we have a diagram, um, and and it's kind of like the the flip. Well, it's the dual of the diagram we use for pullbacks. Okay, for pullbacks, we're finding a cone, the kind of universal cone, the the, the distinguished quintessential object through which you know, uh, everything else factorizes in a way that makes um, the resulting diagram commute for this diagram. For a push out, we're doing so um, uh, for a diagram that's just the reverse of this, right? The arrows turn around. We okay? And and you get something like this. Here's our diagram. And we're going to have the best object is going to be the one which has this universal property. Everything else uniquely factorizes 
thread, right? Um, um, such that um, you you have all of these pushing at it, and, you know, or pointing to it. There's a and it, and there's a set of commuting conditions, and this is the best one in the sense that everything else factorizes through it, and and it it makes all the triangles commute. And it turns out you can write it like this. Instead of drawing these, the the link from C, we can just realize, wait a minute, this is a commuting square. This way is the same as this way. And so, yes, there's a thing from C to V, but it's just a composition of this or equally this and this. And so we don't have to draw it, okay? So this, this here thing is the push out of A and B over C, okay? What would this look like if for a product? If this were a product, what would it look like? Well, I mean, for a normal product, oh, sorry, co-product, what would it look like for co-product? What would it look like? Yeah, well, basically we would, we could just omit these things. Yeah, yeah, we could omit these these things here for a co-product and it would be, um, you know, we have this injection map here such that any other thing out here, which has um, maps out to it, you know, you have this commuting that that basically it can be factorized through you know, that unique way. Um, but basically you'll be without these components, you know, um, or equally, this is the initial object and there's just a unique one in a sort of vacuous way. Um, okay, so, so it, it looks kind of like this, this, any other object that can be linked that has this same structure to it. This one, this one has this nice little structure. Well, th this one could say, I do too. You know, I have that structure. I'm the king. I'm the real king. Um, but the point is that the co-product, if it exists, is the unique one such, uh, is the one, is, is one which, you know, every other one that's the pretender to be the 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 push out factorizes through it um in a way that makes um these uh these structures uh commute. Okay. Um and if you want to find a better description, you can go to Eugenia Chen's book. But I think you remember the essentials of it, right? Um and uh and and basically this is the one, the most parsimonious one. Okay. Um, so so this is our push out, and we encode it like this. It's A or B um over over C. Okay. Now I want to ask you, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with it, right? I mean, um, we've been talking about these levels of abstraction. Hey, hey, I don't know why I'm having such trouble here. It's somehow, oh, I see. I see. I get the I get the shtick. Okay, I get the drift. Um, here, if we have a push out in here, right? So, some of these objects could be push outs of others, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, like, um, this could be the product of this and this, for example, or you know, um, and and this could be the push out of of, of something up here. Maybe it's not fully drawn. But these morphisms here are what? They are, if this is, if this were in this category for graphs, what are these morphisms? They're what? They are, begins with H, homomorphism. They're graph homomorphisms. Here, for discrete dynamical systems, these are what? Homomorphisms for, for graphs, right? These structure-preserving mappings. If one dynamical system is embedded in the other. Are you good with that idea? Okay, so I just want to remind us, bring home the fact that here, if we're talking pushouts and graphs, what are these arrows? They are what? What what is this arrow? If if we were dealing with pushouts of graphs, so if we were doing something like this, where these things are graphs, what are these arrows? They are homomorphisms they're graph homomorphism there's these structure preserving mappings between graphs right are we good with that idea yeah if if we were doing this in set and we are taking the push out you know of sets a and b 
um, in light of this mapping from C to B and C to A, what would these morphisms be in set? They'd be, begins with F. Functions. Functions, yeah. But here they're graph homomorphisms, right? Or or, or discrete, well, here they're graphs, but you know we could do it with discrete dynamical system homomorphisms. We good with that? Okay, so let's let's talk about this. I, we went over this last time, but I was kind of doing it on the fly, and I, I want to make sure everyone's pulling along, right? Um, so 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 check this out. Um, we're going to take the push out of these two graphs. You, but first, I want you to tell me. Here's one graph B. Here's another graph A. If we took the co-product, what would we get? Remember, this is like a souped up co-product. If we took the co-product of this and this, what would we get? What what's the co-product of this graph and this graph? Ignore ignore the red for now. What's the co-product of this and this one? What would it look like? What's that? Y yeah, okay. So you would have a graph, right? A co-product. The apex of a co-product is a graph, it's some graph. And what would that graph look like? The two graphs next to each other. Two graphs next to each other. Yeah. Remember John Bize's thing with the Tinker Toys? Do you remember that? Yeah. So so at the cost of, of maybe um, uh, boring some of you, here's our Tinker Toys. I don't want to look at Tinker Bell. I want to look at Tinker Toys. Here it's, this is what John said co-product is. You just put these things down next to each other. It, it's kind of neat. You say, wow, that, that's a lot of Tinker Toys. That's a lot of Tinker Toys, right? But, but it, you know, what it has in volume, it lacks in creativity, right? Because <laughs> like, you're not, you're not doing the thing you're, you really want to do, which is build things out of them. And to build things out of them, you have to stick them together. And that's what co-product is always uh, going to be about. So let's let's go back from Tinker Tinker Toy or Tinker Bell or whatever, and let's go to um, go back to to this. So co-product would be taking this and just putting it next to this. It's just two components, right? You're either in one or the if you're dealing with the vertex, you're either in one or the other, or you're dealing with that, you're either in one or the other. There's no crosstalk. There's no coupling. There's no linkage there's no plugging them into each other there's no gluing them together right but push out lets us stick them together so how does this work right um so this graph so here we have a c right we have a c that is going to link these so we have a c and what is this what is this morphism it's a what you told me earlier, and I want you to say it again. It's a what? It's a homomorphism. homomorphism. It's a graph homomorphism. It's, for example, it could be embedding this in here. And that's what's happening here. We say this goes to that. Hmm? And we say this goes to that. And by virtue of doing that, now we take these this next to this, but we do what at this point? at these points, we, we glue them. We identify these as the same. This tells us like, what shape do we identify as the same in these guys, right? Um, in this case, it's just a vertex. Mm -hmm. And then we, we take these next to each other, but we, we identify this. These are the same between them. And you get this. Do you see why you get this? Where's this component come from? Where did it come from? This one here, this this little linear one. Where did that come from? B or A? B. Where did this reciprocal one come from? A. But they're glued around this point, right? If you get this idea of gluing, it's going to take you very, very far. David Spivak, you know, really urges students to take that seriously. It sounds kind of hand wavy, but it's it's really useful. Are we good with this? All right, how about this? Okay, so you tell me, what what's going on here? What's different from here? There's some gluing, there's a whole lot of gluing going on, right? But what's the gluing on? Here it was on what? 
Vertex, what are we going on here? An edge and the related vertices, right? So we say, this. Uh, what is this thing? It's a what? Graph what? Homomorphism. I know you're getting sick of it, but but when you can start dreaming of these things like me, you can you can be confident you you've done this enough. Okay, so I'm gonna grab one more. This embeds in that. You you got that? This embeds in that. This is what is S? It's a what? Grab one more. So it says where you know where this uh, embeds. It's a structure preserving mapping in here. So it identifies this with this. Right, the fact that they're their shape is because that's the shape of C, you know, and then we we get this, right? Do do you see where that comes from? Yeah. Um, you know, this component, this one, where did that come from? Which one, from B or from A? From B. That's from B. This one, like going up like this and with this little curly Q, where did that come from? A. A you know, but here. You have them next to each other, but they're glued around this. They're identified around this. And that's the term of art. We identify these things uh, between them. Okay? Um, are, are you comfortable with this? You, you following us? Okay. Um, good. Now, sometimes there are different ways to identify. This is um, uh, a different... Um, different things. For example, we might look at a different homomorphism, right? I mean, this was one homomorphism embedded it here, right? Um, and embedded this one here. But another homomorphism for T would have mapped, embedded that here, right? And it would have embedded this at the same place. So what's the result of this going to be? What you tell me, don't, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Don't peek. What is it going to be? What is it going to be? Uh huh. Okay, it's going to be a, a big line, right? You're going to have this and then this, which is in common, and then this curly Q, right? At the end, it's like a flag flying, fluttering at the end, right? It kind of flutters around at the end. Are, are we good with this? So here we've identified these two and we've glued them together. Hmm. Now, do you start to see why John was saying it was kind of like assembling the Tinker Toys? Because we we kind of say this goes, these two things articulate here, right? And here we are articulating this and this. So we're, we're sort of identifying, we're gluing together around that point, and we get this. And this is very versatile, just by one homomorphism being different, we can get all sorts of neat shapes. But it's not just that. It ain't just graphs. Mm? We can do this for any C set. Because mm? all C sets have finite limits and finite co-limits and so on. So we, they have push-ups. They have pullbacks. They have they also have terminal objects and initial objects, et cetera. They have equalizers and co-equalizers, these structures you may someday hear about. It. So here we can do them for discrete dynamical systems. So here's our discrete, do you remember the deal with discrete dynamical systems? We needed, remember that little one, two, three, four, and A, B and stuff? And we needed them to map to each other, not in any sort of way, but in a way that preserves, that honors, that honors that next operation. Remember that? So here we have that issue. So here, here could be a little. This is a discrete dynamical system, right? It's a, it's an automaton, mm -hmm. and we could have be this, be this one, right? Where we have how many states does this have? Three. You get started maybe at this one, go to that one, and then you go to this one, you just stay there. You're trapped. Are we okay with that? Yeah, I mean, maybe we wouldn't want to be trapped there, but you know, it, you're comfortable. Oh. Okay, this one, how many states do we have? Four. You go and you get trapped. Um, and what are we doing here? We are identifying what with what. Mm 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we're identifying this with this. And now we got something like this. There's a common part. And like this state, where, where did this state come from? From B or from A? This one here. From B. It's this one here, right? This one came from that one. Yeah. You know? This one, where did he come from? A. And she, where did she come from? This one here, right? But, it, and you can see it's, do you remember, for dynamical systems, if we had co-product, think tinker toys next to each other, we have co-product of this and this, what would we have seen? Two separate ones, right? They would have been solitudes. They wouldn't have stuck together, right? They're just, you're either in this one or you're in that one and you go, but you're, you're never... You're never in a state that is identified between them. No, no, no. It's just you're in one or the other, right? This or that, yeah? Um, but here we have a common state, right? Now, you're either in these states up here or, or these ones, or you're in a state that's in kind of in both, right? Um, so you can identify. Um, no, I'm, I'm wanting you to think about this a little bit. Like, you might be excused for asking, this is kind of cool. Um, this is kind of cool. What if, mm, what if we could have state here without without next? Uh, it, it's it, yeah, without without next. If, if we could somehow, um, could we have a a state by itself which we identify this one and this one? Could we do that? Could we have just state state? And and we we say we're going to consider a mapping to this and a mapping to this and identify them, glue them together around the state. Could we do that? Cannot. Cannot. Can, can we go look at this? Can we, can I guess just go show this to you quickly? Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Um. Oh no! I closed it. Oh, uh, okay. Um, let me let me go get it back. Um, I, I did a bad thing. Yeah, we can't now. We don't have a well-defined next, right? Yeah, we exactly. We, we we can't we can't go here at the same time as we're going there. Yeah. We have to go to one or the other. And, and so it would violate the mathematical structure of the situation. Um, each state needs a well-defined what? Next state, right? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, let me let me go down to this. I sort of screwed this up and, and I'm I'm sorry by 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 accidentally closing it. Okay. Um look at that. Um Okay, yeah, show you and put together a really nice, nice one here with the in in color. Check check that out. Well, we may get to that. She did a great job with that. Okay, so here we're gonna do discrete dynamical systems, and we're going to do, and this is our. Do you remember this? This is our schema, right? We're displaying the structure, the presentation of the schema category. And do you remember I told you that, like, how many? So this is a presentation of a category. How many morphisms does this have? Okay, yeah, it has infinitely many. Because it, it it has next and has next, next, and has next, 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 and it has next, 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 next. Now, those are those are free. So each each one is in general different, but it has to be associative, right? Um but there's also one called ID, right? Which is not even shown, right? Um, has to be associated. We covered this in a past time. Okay, so so uh, here I I'm I'm sort of you know uh, ready to ready to go, and we're gonna go down, and we're gonna I'm gonna go get these ones here that I graphed out. Here we go. 
Um, uh, so I'm gonna execute this um, for this. Do you recognize that from from this? You know, uh, this one up here. You know, um, and then we're gonna go uh, mumble. Um, three states then trapped. Right. Um, well, what I lack in elegance, I make up for in clarity, at least. Um, okay. Um, okay. Three states then trapped. Here, here we are. Um, let's let's graph it out. Are we, do you recognize these? Okay. Now this is where we took the oh no DDS single state. Okay, I've got to go up and okay okay and mumble mumble. Uh, DDS single. Where's DDS single state? Um, must have defined it down. DDS, hey, where's DDS single state? DDS, hey, where is it? DDS single state. Hey, oh my goodness. Well, you, you're going to tell me how I, it, it looks like I wiped it out or somehow. So you're going to tell me how do I define this? This is a good, good little exercise. Maybe it's the most basic of these. How can I define a single state here? You tell me. Sorry? One state and, and um, don't get it confused with this. This is a graph of the schema, right? This, this is, yeah, but don't get them confused. So we're gonna have DDS single state, right? equals a C set because it's a map from a, it's a C set, right? We're going to get to the A in this A C set soon. Um, and this is a DDS instance. It's a map from this schema into set. Are we good with this? Okay. Um, and how many states? One. And what's its next? What's it? What's Next it? Is empty. Next is empty. Uh, uh, okay, so suppose I tried that. So 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 I welcome ideas. Well, suppose I tried those. Um, is next empty? Okay. What it? Let Let's think. This is a C set, right? Hmm. So here's my schema, right? This is an object in the schema, and the object gets mapped over to what set of states? What are the set of states here? One, right? One. This morphism next, that gets mapped over to what? So a morphism in the schema category presented here gets mapped over to a what? What, so 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 when you're mapping from a schema category, there's a morphism in the schema category. You know, for a graph, it'll be source and target. For here, it's neck. When you map it over into set, each morphism in the schema category turns into a what in set? A morphism in set. And what's a morphism in set? It's a... What's a morphism in the category set? A function. It's a function, right? And what is a job of a function? To be a legitimate function, what does it need to do? If it's, so this is a function from what set to what set? Next is, a, is gonna be, when we map it over into set, when we, you know, I even have a picture of this, right? I, I even have a, even have a picture of this somewhere. So let, let's go drag that out. Oh, oh come on. Um, here we are. Um, uh, so we're going to have, uh, um, here's set, right? Right? S state gets mapped to state, right? Uh, to a set of states. Are we good with that? And neck, the morphism nets here, morphisms in the schema category, this is a C set. So it maps this over to a morphism and set. And a morphism and set is a what? It's a function. And this is a function from the set mapped to by the source of this arrow to the target, right? What's the source of this arrow next? 
state, right? And so it's it mapped from the set of states to the set of states. We go with that, the idea of next. What is the set of states for our particular case here? What's our set of states? Hmm? What's our set of states? One, one. So a function to be a legitimate function, it has to map for every element of the set from which it goes, the set of states, it has to specify what it maps to. Mm -hmm. So we have to specify it logically. One. One. Right now it goes to zero, which is not a, I mean, I don't even know what that means, but uh, it goes to zero. I, I guess it means it's not specified and it cause problems. Anyway, the, do you see that this has to be, I mean, a function to be a, a function. It, its job in life, it, it has a contract. It has to fulfill. It has to map every, so a function goes from set X to set Y. It has to map every element of set X to some particular value of Y. Do you agree with that? So it has to map this to, to some state, and there's only one state, so it has to look like this, okay? Are we okay with that? Okay, so let's 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 map that out if we could, or let's let's do it. Two graph viz, right? Gra graph, graph viz, and then we have to do elements, and then we have DDS single state, and hey, get back here. Yeah, looks like that. Are we okay with that? Okay, now, so I want to ask you. I want to ask you. So, if that's the case, now we're back to this. This is our single state, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Can we find a homomorphism from this into this? To this state here. Remember the homomorphism property. Remember homomorphisms are what? Begins with N. It has two words. N and T. The first word begins with N. What a homomorphism in C sets. A homomorphism between C sets is a what? Natural, Natural transformation, right? And do you remember the naturality condition? Remember this? Do you, do you, do you, ah, I closed it again. It's, it's okay. Let, let's go. No, let's not do that. Um, we have to do the naturality squares. It's exactly right. Thank you. Um, did I? No, I, I didn't want that one. I didn't want that one. I wanted the one on, wanted the one on levels of abstraction. Sorry. Um, no, I'm really screwed up. Okay, uh, here we are. Um, okay. Um, okay, so we want this. Remember, we have to have this naturality square, right? Do you remember that? Okay. Um, so if we have a... We had a loop. I, uh, do I have a nice picture of it um uh, i don't have a nice picture of it I have a bad picture of it okay here it looks something like this right um and the naturality condition has to say look if we start in a certain state so this is one dynamical system this is the other dynamical system right if we start in a state we have to be able to do next in this dynamical system and then map over uh, to that, map over to here. Um, uh, so, so if we start in this state, mm -hmm. this is, remember, this is a dynamical system, right? It's a, it's a one state dynamical system. Are we okay with that? So if we're considering a homomorphism from this to this, we want to say, we want to identify this. We can either start in the state, take next here, and then map over, and we have to get the same thing in the naturality square, right? Um, if we do that, we have to get the same thing as if we map over and then take next, right? So we map over and then take next here. 
Will we get the same state? No, we will not. There is no homomorphism from this to this. It'll be unnatural. It will not be natural. Do you, do you get that point? We, we can't just nicely embed this in this. This isn't just a sub piece of it. This isn't this isn't just a summary of this in a way that preserves its structure. No, this is this is different from it. And sometimes, as we've learned, there's no homomorphisms between certain things, right? Or this would be here. Um, these discrete dynamical systems. Sometimes there's no homomorphisms. So so there, as as much as we yearn to identify this. One with this and, and identify it with this and say they're the same, we cannot. And it and it gets back to what Nona was saying earlier, which is actually it wouldn't make sense, right? Like this is stopping us from doing something that would be kind of nonsensical, right? Because each of these needs a well-defined next. And we'd suddenly be endowing if we some somehow could shoehorn it, could, you know, um could wrench it into this form and you have two necks that that wouldn't make sense it's not a dynamical system anymore it's not a discrete dynamical system in this sense that it, anymore so we we couldn't have two necks we need one next and the, what this has told us is there ain't no next that's going to give you this there's no natural way to capture this structure here are we okay with this okay so Maybe it seems frustrating, but this is capturing the essential mathematical structure. And the fact that there's no homomorphism is saying you can't do it. And, and that captures our intuitions, after all, if we reflect on it. But it's telling us immediately you can't do it. And categorical, we cannot do it. it if, if we ask, if we were to ask here, I'm going to go try it, right? Um, Here's our single state. We kind of got, I kind of got distracted, right? Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to map, I'm going to ask about the homomorphisms from the, from this to this. You're, and you're going to tell me what homomorphisms are there from this to this. Okay, no, why, why can't I? Sometimes there's this thingy and sometimes it's not. What are the homomorphisms here? Mm -hmm. From, from this to this, I'm saying. Well, okay. Homomorphisms from this to this whole thing. How many homomorphisms? Is there one from here to here? The state to here? No. Is there one from here to here? Is there one from here to here? Is there a homo? Yes. <laughs> Darn right there is. So so let's let it do the do the walking. Um, there's one. There's one where it maps to state three. Hmm? Yeah, and you cannot do that because it has to map to a function which maps all the states to something. And and you, you just can't do it. You you wish you could do it and say, like, I'm not gonna tell you which one it maps, but you can't, because a function has to map all the elements of it, and it's saying it's not logically consistent. Eh? Now yeah, I'm, I want to bring this back as I did in my opening remarks to, to the astonishing thing that's taking place here. Because when when we're doing this, it's not like this homomorphism has been designed by somebody just to operate with discrete dynamical systems. It's not it's not been hard coded in what discrete dynamical systems are and to into cat lab or whatever it, it doesn't have to be built in some c plus plus data structure for causal loop diagrams or or you know graphs or or you know these uh these uh, agent like we can build all of these different things we automatically get this ability to reason powerfully about what is a structure preserving transformation. And we can use these very general operations like homomorphism, regardless of whether we're dealing with graphs or whether we're dealing with discrete dynamical systems or whether we're dealing with 
you know, this agent like schema or whether we're dealing with causal loop diagrams or whether we're dealing with stock flow diagrams or whether we're dealing with system structure diagrams or whether we're dealing with an ABM. All of these just again and again and again and again, we can reuse these mechanisms. It's this incredible versatility and power of the software engineering involved because it it's like it's getting these incredibly reusable bits of logic that we get automatically. And again, so much of the strength here is we capture the mathematical essence and we encode our structures as data, not as code, not as opaque code that can't be analyzed and transformed. But instead, we put them in the, the mathematical structure is evident in clear light of day. And then we can reason about what are their connections to one another, their homomorphisms. We can reason about their co-product or their push-out or their product and they're, they're an equalizer, a co-equalizer, an initial, a terminal, and, you know, the sub-object classifier. We can do all of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this, and, and just to drive this home, and we, we have to wrap up here, but um, I, I want to, I want to highlight that um, we can do this. I mean, do this for, for C-sets in general, right? We, we've seen it for graphs and, uh, ah, I don't know what I just did. I did something. Undo. Boom. Okay. Undo. Boom. Undo. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Fine. Well, um, fine. Um, so we, we did this for graphs and we did it for discrete dynamical systems. I just want to point you to the fact, and, and this is provided up on the the site, you know, if we have causal loop diagram, remember we have this kind of causal loop diagram and, you know, we saw what co-product was for these, right? Or we put these side by side, just like the Tinker Toys, like John said, side by side, right? And, but here we can, we can do something like take their push out. Mm -hmm. We could take a push out by identifying, like we could take, um, causal loop diagram A, um, uh, maybe this one, and causal loop diagram B. And then we could say with a push out square, this sort of thing, we could say, identify through a homomorphism, this vertex, you know, vertex one with this, vertex two with this, and this other way identify this is vertex one, vertex two, and we could glue them together. Hmm? we glue them together around the, this one to this one and this one to this one. We say, stick these together. Now, we might be able to stick together some of these as well, but we'd have to be really careful, you know, to, are the source and the target going the right direction? But at the least we could say, identify this vertex with this and this one with this, okay? And it's a little bit hideous. This is what I was doing kind of there, to, you know, at the, at the last, last minute, but, um, you know, here we have a vertex pair, which is a pair of, of vertices, right? And and I'm going to, with that vertex pair, say the first element of the vertex pair goes to this, the second one goes to this, the first one goes to this, first second one goes to that, as two homomorphisms. And then we take the push out and bada bing, bada boom, you, you get boom. Um, you get the the push out and what it lacks in beauty it makes up for in structure so here we go we have this vertex pair and we take the the homomorphisms from that vertex pair v v1 and v2 into causal loop diagram one and we find there's four of them you know v1 and v2 can both go to 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 vertex one in the homomorphism in the causal loop diagram 1a or they can go to one and two, or they can go to two and one, or two and two. It says, which do you want? And I say, okay, I want this guy here, the second one. And same thing with mapping the causal loop diagram B. So here I'm kind of mapping up, you know, I'm mapping up pair of vertices, this one and then this one, and I'm doing the same thing here. I'm basically saying, which of these things get identified with each other? Do you get that idea? It's, it's kind of like this, where I said, you know, map this to this and this one to this, and by extension, the edge to this. And, and 
that has to be identified as these two vertices with this edge, right? A little bit similar, a little bit similar. Um, and you do that and, and I say, okay, I want number two here. And then I'm gonna do it and it produces something which again, lacks aesthetics, but has beauty of logical structure. <laughs> so it, it, if you like stars, maybe you like this, but um, right here's vertex one, vertex two, they're identified between the two when we have like a, a minus link from there to there and uh, from here to here, because source is going here, target's going here. And here's another minus link from source here to this and L plus from source to this one. And, and this one from this source to, to this one. But anyway, the point is I glued those together. I took these, which were virtually fragmented, much like these, these um, uh, Tinker Toys, just sitting next to one another, and we stuck them together. And we by sticking them together, we could all do all sorts of neat things. Mm? And I'll tell you what someone did with Tinker Toys. You may not believe this. Founder of KSR Research. His name has been lost in my head right now, but I'll, um, I could look it up in so could you. Um, uh, so when he was little, he was a child, he built a computer out of Tinker Toy, a logical computer where he had OR gates and AND gates and NOT gates, and he could manipulate it and it could compute simple, I think it could like add to four digit numbers or something weird like that, but out of Tinker Toys. That's the power, ladies and gentlemen, of being able to put them together, glue them together, hmm? glue them together around common points. And the same thing, I will add, same darn thing, same darn story, same reusable components when we do this with, with, um, uh, we could, we can do this for our agent like schema, right? We could take a co product of two things. Here's a person, and they have an age group in province. Here's a person, they have the age group. In I think you understand how this is like the co product of these two, right? Yeah. But we could identify them. Uh, we could identify certain things. So maybe you remember this one. What is this one saying? Do you remember the idea? Is this is a pattern, and we can map it into. We can map it into a, a population. So what would this be saying? If this were a pattern, we were finding homomorphisms into a population, what would it be looking for? Hmm? It would be looking for what? I'll give you a hint, two people with what? Is it any old two people? Same, same pro They have the same province yeah. and they have the same age group, right? Uh -huh. And... And I'm saying we can do that by taking our single person. Here's a single. I don't mean they're unmarried. It's just they're, 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 they're single. And we could take a same province. We could, here we have one age group in one province. Mm -hmm. Note there's no problem because there's no morphism out of this that we have to specify. So these are just kind of destinations. So we could have one of those and one of those. And then we can have a homomorphism that says, okay, um, uh, we're going to map um, age group in person one. Um, this will go to the age group of person one and it will go to the age group of person two. This will go to the province in person one, the province in person two. And that's exactly what we do. We have these homomorphisms from same province and age group, these two things alone into single person. Single person is this guy up here, right? And 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 we just identify in the single age group, it maps to the age group of one, the age group of the other. You know, that's what this the single person and then this one uh kind of similar idea and and we end up um uh we end up being able to create the same structure that we could define manually. We just wire them up, right? Push outs, ladies and gentlemen, are going to be key to our future. Indeed, our, our destiny 
and joining together in, in composing stock flow diagrams, composing full-fledged causal loop diagrams, composing system structure diagrams, and indeed composing these patterns we use in agent-based models. They provide this key glue. They provide this ability to stick things together out of which, which allow us to turn the set of disconnected, fragmented components into interconnected holes. And indeed, category theory, I believe, is a pillar of system science, a science of the whole that is all about the connections between things, not merely the pieces. And pushouts provide us that, that bridge into that world. And we're going to be using them extensively for this course, OK? in, in our, our daily work. And I think with those words, I will close this session. And uh, I will uh, close, uh, close today's class. We will be next week continuing on to, um, we'll introduce a C sets, attributed C sets, um, how we have attributes in a pragmatic way. I'm not gonna go into all the pro functor based theory or slice categories. We could always do that later, but then we're gonna be going on to, to talk about the basics of these structures uh, for causal loop diagrams, for system structure diagrams, or in, and particularly for stock flow, and how we can join them together with things like um, structured co-spans. And their pushouts will be the, a star of the show. Okay? Okay. All right, that's all for today. Thank you. It's been a brutal day. Um, and uh, I, I'm i skipping the, I, I canceled the group meeting tonight so that I can rest. Okay, take care there.